Welcome to the Why Not Podcast with me, Chrissy Hawkins. In a world where everybody asks you why, I'm here to ask why not. So sit back and relax or walk and listen and join me on this journey as we try to answer this never ending question. What makes people say why not? All right. Hi guys, welcome back to Why Not. So I have another guest for you guys today. I'm really excited to bring to you Aoife Smith. So Aoife Smith is a psychotherapist. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to let Aoife tell you all about herself because she's going to describe it much better. So first off, I just want to say welcome to the podcast, Aoife. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Chrissy. You're so good. Um, And thank you for the the wonderful introduction. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I am a psychotherapist, um, but I was originally a veterinary nurse. So I've kind of molded, I guess, welded the two together, welded more so I would say now, um, so that I work a lot with the veterinary community, you know, one-to-one in psychotherapy sessions, but also do talks and conference workshops and do a little bit of lecturing in um, the vet school as well so yeah that's that's pretty much what I do it's um niche but it's it's lovely and I I love it it's great that's really cool like because obviously you know like vet vets are going to need <laughs> help like with the sort of yeah. stuff they go through like I can't even imagine like even things like putting animals down and stuff like that mm-hmm. um but how did you originally move from the veterinary nursing into psychotherapy Yeah, love that question. So I graduated from veterinary nursing in 2014, so 10 years ago now. I can't believe that it's been 10 years. The time has flown, but it has. Um, And while I was on placement and doing my rotations, my final year rotations and things, I sort of realized that vet nursing wasn't necessarily what I wanted to be doing at that time. I was 21 and I think that veterinary nursing as a career is is a huge commitment which is completely valid like it's a it's a very intense commitment um you know for a career and at that time I just didn't I didn't want to to step into that just yet so I I decided to sort of take a bit of a pause um and that that sort of led me to working in all these random jobs I worked in retail for a bit and insurance and just sort of had a really lovely fun time with my early 20s I lived in Australia for a year so I moved to Melbourne in 2017 and then when I was there that kind of gave me the time to consider okay what what do I want moving forward like what do I want out of life and I had done a psychology module in my final year of vet nursing and I did really well in it which was really really nice it was a little confidence boost and I really enjoyed it and so at the time when I did it it was so funny like looking back but I actually said to myself I'm I'm too young for this or I'm not like I don't think I'm quite ready to dip into this just yet which was funny that I was able to recognize but when I was 25 and in Australia I was like right now it's time so that's what I did I came home and I did a HDIP um so I did like a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and that took me two years and then while I was doing that I realized that I absolutely want to be a psychotherapist I want to be a counselor and um, so I started volunteering with Samaritan straight away so I volunteered with them for three years on the phones and not many people know this but you do see people in person too so that was really cool because people can sort of just walk in off the street and you have a chat with them and it's it's just the loveliest work it's really difficult but it's lovely um, and yeah so while I was doing that then I was also doing my psychotherapy training so I just graduated last November 2023 with my master's master's in counseling and psychotherapy and I'm just about a year out now so yeah that's kind of my my timeline that's amazing um so you know when you like bring it back to vet nursing when you made that decision that I'm not I'm not going to go into vet nursing what was Mm -hmm. the reaction around you because like you spent so long studying for something like that where people kind of shocked or yeah perceived yeah, I love that you've raised that as well, Chrissy, because I think there can be an awful lot of pressure, can't there, for people, you know, who have worked hard at something. And I think that the really common reaction, particularly in Ireland, is, but sure, you've done it, so stay. Or, but mm-hmm. you, you've done it, so stick it out. Um, So I did have that. I absolutely did have that. And my family are a really supportive group of people, but I absolutely had that initial reaction first, you know, particularly from my parents who had witnessed me with their own two eyes go through four years of of really difficult coursework and they were like oh my goodness what do you mean you're you're leaving and I was when I chose to left to leave I was um 
I was in an internship at the time and I really wanted to go to drama school for a bit too, just to see what that was like. So I did that for two years, but I was kind of struggling to get the, the time off for an audition that I wanted to go to. And so I just quit. <laughs> Like, I just quit. I just felt the pull and I was like, let me just have my notice in. I, I think I'm done here, you know. Um, and so, yeah, that that definitely came as a big shock. I think there's a really funny misconception from people that, you know, if you're not directly using a degree. Um, so, you know, studying veterinary nursing, being a veterinary nurse, if you're not using it in that direct way, that it's a waste or a waste of time. But I would argue that no experience is a waste of time at all and mm -hmm. I managed to circle back you know years later and I didn't even know that was coming but just in a different way so I'm so glad that I like trusted myself with that um and I suppose for anybody listening to this too who's also in that position of you know maybe about to take the leap with anything in life like I'd always say trust yourself like trust your gut you you always know best you know because at the end of the day like my parents and my family and things like that you know people around me and colleagues as well yeah they might have been shocked but at the end of the day they can't un unzip me and climb into my body and live my life yeah. I'm the only one that can do that and has to do that so yeah I don't know if I answered your question there no I kind of tried to head talk it for a minute but <laughs> I think I think you got the gist <laughs> yeah, no, it's really funny you say that because I feel like I did something similar. Like I mm -hmm. did communications, uh, graduated in 2013 and then was just mm -hmm. like, I don't want to do this. And I went and did retail um, and then I eventually went into the PT. But now it's kind of like that. It's come full circle. I'm yeah. back kind of doing media work and actually really interested in enjoying it. And like yourself, like you have that, you know what veteran nurses are going through when you're dealing with them. So it's it's never a waste and it's yeah. a brilliant outlook to have. And I think it is worth to tell people that because so many are going to be like, why am I wasting my time? But like you actually didn't. The stuff yeah. you learned then will come back to you at some point. Yeah, 100%. Like I've had experiences that, you know, other people in other careers definitely won't ever have. And mm -hmm. they're so valuable to me. And that's also the negative experiences too. You know, I've I've seen really, really harsh things. Um but it's shaped how I see the world and who I am and what I've become now, you know, which I'm so proud of. So other people should be proud of themselves too for that, you know. I think it's it's really interesting as well that you were saying there that um, when you did the psychology, you're like, you're too young. Do you feel like yeah. to work in that kind of industry, you do need a little bit of life experience or has that changed, that idea has changed over, over the years? Yeah, my idea around that has definitely changed for sure. At that time, I've come to realize, I think that it's an individualized thing. Um, so, you know, I was too young, quote unquote, I suppose, um, in, in my own context of my own life. But for example, I have a pal and she is also a psychotherapist and she's a bit younger than I am. And she went into psychology straight out of school, I believe. And she is one of the most fantastic therapists that I know. And she's in her mid twenties and she's absolutely flying. Like, I just can't speak and like highly enough of her so you know age I think definitely comes into play for some people but then again I'm like is it age or is it I don't know emotional maturity um and yeah where you are on on your own your own path at the time you know yeah I think as well maybe you can feel like you're not going to be taken seriously when you're young as a therapist because people will be like what do you know Basically. Absolutely, absolutely. I actually had, yes, I, I've had that issue sort of already because I started seeing clients when I was 28. Mm -hmm. So people were like, or sorry, just about to turn 29. And I remember, you know, the body language that I was met with, particularly from other therapists and things. And they would see me come in and go, okay, you're a, a, a young child. <laughs> Why are you here? You know, even though I was in my late 20s at the time and I'm, I'm 31 now. And sometimes I still see it if you meet another practitioner who's um, a little bit more experienced and a little bit older, they'll look at you a little bit, like a little bit side eye to be like, what, are, how, how are you here? How are you doing this? You know? Um, so yeah, it is a funny one, but funnily enough, clients have never, my age has never come into it ever, yeah. which is so lovely. So I've seen clients who are 20 plus years older than I am and it, it goes so well like they they've never once questioned my age or my knowledge because of 
my age, you know, which is just brilliant, which goes to show that if you're practicing and doing, you know, practicing ethically and doing the work correctly, your age doesn't really come into it, you know? Yeah. And that's probably why your friend is flying at it as well, because yeah. she, she does it right, basically, for want of a better description. <laughs> yeah she's amazing yeah she's absolutely amazing so yeah it's um yeah it is a funny one though with with age for sure I'm glad that you raised that because it is an interesting one for sure <laughs> yeah no it's just you know now I know this is different because I I psychotherapy and psychology that's a hell of a lot of work you know you see some of these very young people who become life coaches and yes. you know they just don't really understand and I can comment on this because as a PT when I was younger I was like you can make time to train blah blah blah, blah. and now I'm like yeah, that was really uh, easy for me to say as a 25-year-old childless person. Um, yeah. Now I'd never say that. If people are like, I'm like, if you can't come, that's fine. You might yeah. have to deal with it. Um, and it's like, it's funny. It took me several, I mean, it took me getting to my late 20s, 30s, seeing people have children to understand mm -hmm. that. So I think, I do think the like psychotherapy side is different because there's a lot more, it's, it's, like it I don't know how to describe it but there's a lot more research and study gone into techniques to help people I think yeah yeah for sure it's less too about your own experience as well so like mm. my experience never really comes into play um in the room it does by default because I'm human so I show up as Aoife based mm -hmm. on you know my life up to this point right but you know in the room I don't ever offer sort of my own perspectives or like you know a client might say that something happened to them I'll never be like me too or same yeah. I was fine <laughs> you know because it doesn't it doesn't come into it like yeah. it's, what, what comes into play is, is solely the client's material and that's it you know uh, I love the way you say that because I can't think of anything worse than a therapist <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I've done therapy the last year myself and I'm like oh god can you imagine they said that you'd be like what <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I actually had a therapist one time who self-disclosed so, so much. And I left her in the end because we hit a brick wall in a session one day and I was explaining something that I had that I had done, that a situation that had come up in my life like recently, you know, in, in recent weeks, and I was explaining it to her. And <laughs> she she said to me quite harshly, like, well, why did you go back there then? <laughs> I was going oh my goodness there's so many other avenues that you could have taken there um aside from the accusatory why statement I mm -hmm. just felt so let down but she also would say things like you know I don't know if I was speaking about body image or something one day she I remember her telling me that she was also worried that she wasn't attractive when she was my age and started telling me about her weight worrying about her weight during pregnancy and all of these things that I just didn't need to know about and that was so specific too because I don't have any children and wasn't pregnant at the time so I just I'm like sorry and I'm also not pregnant now that wasn't a that wasn't an announcement my goodness the way that I phrased that sorry think about that don't worry yeah, no um but yeah but I just thought like goodness that's a lot of self-disclosure and as I sort of moved forward in my own practice and I, I think over the last little while I've really come to realize how how damaging self-disclosure a lot of it can be you know sometimes it's useful but other times it's it's not you know and knowing knowing when it is and when it isn't is really important you know yeah that's that's uh, interesting how do you find finding that balance do you mm. find it difficult or is it something it kind of comes naturally to you yeah that's such a good question so sometimes it's a little bit more tempting than others um because sometimes a client will bring in a story that will trigger a memory for me because it's maybe similar or I maybe can relate to the story a little bit um but what happens then is I'm able to have the privilege of going to what's called clinical supervision. So I've got a supervisor and I see her every single week and I take my cases to her and sort of just introduce everybody, tell her what's happening at that time. Um, and she just makes sure that I'm working ethically. And if 
things like that come up for me. You know, I can go into her and say, this client told me a story about X, Y, Z. I remembered a time when that happened to me. This is how I felt at the time. And we'll kind of hash it out so mm-hmm. that I don't, I don't have to say it to the client. Like there's no need for me to go, okay, let's take a pause and talk about my story so that we can continue your session. So what I usually do is I will just gently um, pop it to one side and, and deal with it after the session if it's yeah and if it's particularly triggering and upsetting I also have a therapist too so I've got two women taking very good care of me so um sometimes it crosses over and I might like you know go into therapy and have a cry or something and just fill the therapist in and then it's yeah and then it's all sorted so yeah it's actually not too bad but clinical supervision and therapy are are two things that definitely help me balance that out yeah how important do you think it is to have those those kind of things as a therapist Oh my God. So important. So, so important. Oh my goodness. And I can really see how important it is just to go to therapy. And I think that that's such an obvious statement to make. And I'm a little bit biased because I'm a therapist, but it's so important to go to therapy. Um, It doesn't work for everyone. So it's okay if someone is listening and they're thinking, it didn't work for me. I went, wasn't my thing. Like that's so okay. But giving it a go, I would always recommend, you know, because it's just, it's so, so important. And I think also it's a really empowering thing to do, you know, just bravely and boldly walking in and taking responsibility for your own stuff is Mm. is just such an important thing to do, you know. It's interesting you're saying like, it's not for everybody. Do you think most like do you think it's not for everybody or there's a majority of people who didn't click with their therapist and then write it off yeah a bit of both bit of both I see the didn't click with the therapist a whole lot um and it's so lovely actually I I do and I have had clients in the past come in and go I haven't clicked with my therapist and by the grace of God something good happens and they click with me and it's lovely and they're like oh okay great I actually have the baseline connection with this therapist like let me give this another go and to be able to hold space for that second go and um, for me is such an honor it's so so lovely so you know yes there's definitely that I didn't click with my therapist um but also there is definitely the people out there that it just doesn't doesn't work for them um even sort of different modalities and things and there can be a couple of reasons for that like you know personality comes into it and you know where they're at in life just different things can kind of come into play um that you know psychotherapy might not necessarily be the right thing at that time I can think of one example actually grief right if you if someone passes away someone very close to you passes away like last week let's say and you come to therapy this week you might not be ready for therapy like it might just not be the right time and that person will come to therapy I've experienced this as a practitioner for sure that person will come to therapy thinking this is the right thing to do or I should I guess in in inverse commas come to therapy but actually it's not the right time and they're not ready for it and they'll usually sort of drop off make an exit and they may come back in like it could take someone two or three years hey remember me hi now I'm ready to talk about this you know so yeah there's loads of factors that come into it for sure yeah I think in grief in particular like there's no timeline for when that starts to improve I'm never going to say gone but like I think people sometimes are like it's been a month why am I not over I was like because that's a big deal like 100% and I love that you raise that too because I see that all the time it's been seven years why am I not over this it's been 20 years I should be over this I also have heard the measurement of months it's been it's been five months why why can't I get over this and that to me is the concept of us getting over the loss of a person I think needs to be handled a lot more gently in society because I would argue in my personal and professional opinion that we never get over it we learn how to cope with the loss, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Like for example, for me, my grandparents, I lived with my grandparents for pretty much my whole life. Um, We had a busy household and it was lovely. But my granddad died when I was 16 and my Nana died when I was 19. And I am not over them and I never will be. And, but it's okay. 
you know and i've just learned how to interact with that grief on on the daily and it's it's so interesting when you i think open up the space and allow yourself to go on that journey of coping and that journey of interaction with the grief rather than the this idea of getting over it and my relationships with them it's funny because my relationships with both of them have changed over the years even though they're not here anymore so that i've really found fascinating sort of my memories of them how i interpret those memories at 31 is different to how i would have interpreted them at 20 at 16 at whatever age so it's a really lovely thing actually to process if you can you know allow yourself to open up that space rather than than that idea of just getting over them because I don't think that you will you know I think it's really good that you've said that um and I think it's really important to highlight that because I do think a lot of people put a lot of pressure um on themselves to be okay and they're almost apologizing sometimes when they're not but it's not a problem like it's not a they shouldn't have to apologize for it they shouldn't have to get over it like yeah yeah 100 percent. like just the other day I I'm in my luteal phase <laughs> and just the other day I was doing admin and I just got tired all of a sudden and I am really good with asking myself what I need and what I want sometimes what I need and what I want is a cup of tea and a slice of cake with my granddad I haven't seen him since 2009 <laughs> but just acknowledging that that's what I wanted yeah. and then being able to say okay well I can't have that in the physical form so what can I maybe do here to invite in whatever that experience was because I obviously thought of that experience for a reason so the feelings associated with that are like comfort calm and um, safety you know all of those feelings so I take those and go okay how can I invite those in in another way you know and sometimes it is going to see him with flowers and just sitting down on the ground in a graveyard and having a chat but other times it's not it's putting on the kettle and having tea by myself and just thanking him for my experiences with him you know what I mean whatever yeah. it looks like, you know and it might look like something completely different on another day um but getting over it like if I if I said oh my god it's been I can't do maths 2009 is a long time ago well how long ago is that years ago. Years ago. So, yeah 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 that's a long like ago. what really already <laughs> yeah 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 for sure I'm like whoa but yeah, if I had said like, oh, you know, it's been 15 years, like, why can't I get over it? I would have never recognized the feelings that I wanted to have, like the calm and the safety. And I would have never moved forward with trying to get those for myself. I would have just beat myself up and maybe cried some more. <laughs> like, you know, and nothing would have, nothing would have come out of it at all, you know? Yeah, I love that. Um, Even just sitting there and thinking about it and just like asking those questions. Mm. maybe not great yeah we broke up just a little bit could you repeat that sorry yeah um so like how important do you th do you think it is to like ask yourself those questions when you're feeling like a little bit down or you know not like even even though you said you're in your luteal phase that's completely normal for you to be not in the best of form and I think yeah. we need to highlight that as well for women out there that's the yeah part. <laughs> yeah 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 for sure um yeah no absolutely I think it's so important and I think being gentle with yourself is really key and asking those questions so acknowledging I feel sad for example and then asking yourself well how do I want to feel and I think that gives you a little bit more room to process the sadness and just let the sadness be and eventually it will transmute into you know whatever it is that you would prefer but in the moment acknowledging that sadness and sort of moving through it I think is is the most important thing um we just don't give negative emotions enough space I don't think especially in 2024 we're in this age of instant gratification and that yeah. idea that like you know you hit something with your thumb and it's done like emails are sent and um, comments are made likes are are sent and feelings for some reason I think we just have this the same attitude to feelings we can't just switch them off or hit send and send them away you know um, <laughs> that's a really good way of saying it yeah like we just need to we need to just take take our time and just be a little bit gentler with ourselves I think yeah for sure yeah one thing I've learned over the last uh year is and I think it's been really transformative in a way is 
you're always going to have bad days. Yeah. And it's not a bad thing. It doesn't make you a bad person. Yes. If you have them, the good days will come again. But just maybe be kind to yourself. Ask yourself how you're feeling, like you're saying there. Um, And once you kind of accept that, it's like no longer, a, oh, I feel shit. There's something wrong with me. It's yeah. wild. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, it's so, so important to just be gentle with yourself. And also those bad days. I think that people are so quick to make it mean something about them as a person like stop making it mean something about yourself it doesn't mean something about you it's just a bad day and it's not a bad life like it's going to be okay you know yeah like it literally could be you slept badly it could be like you said you're, you're in your luteal phase you're gonna have a bad day just because you're moody because because of life yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can't control it but when you kind of Sometimes I do that now if like, I mean, it's not, I'm like, I look at my like tracker on my phone and I'm like, ah, look, there we are. That's coming mm. soon. That's why I'm moody today. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And getting to know yourself like that, I think is so, so important too. I honestly think the, the menstrual cycle is the most fascinating thing and the most powerful thing about people who have wombs, uteruses, um, I just think it's it's so so powerful and when we harness that and work with that I think it honestly it just makes such magic you know being able to know um how you might be feeling and see patterns in yourself I think that's so empowering I think it's so cool yeah no it really is and I would have been at the camp for ages where like I just hated my period um I just mm. like you know you kind of know feeling yourself when it's coming you'd be like oh this is gonna be horrible next few days mm. and now when you actually kind of look at it and like you said it's so empowering to like look at it and go okay so I'm at that phase of my cycle so that means now okay fine now I'm not, yeah. now I'm not randomly pissed off because I know I might be a little bit crankier for this reason yeah yeah for sure and like I think it's so important to to prep for those times like you know that when you're ovulating you're most likely going to have a little bit more energy um now it might be diff a little bit different for some people like I've got endometriosis so that's not always the case but okay. um you know like you're able to plan ahead if you see patterns you know you can catch them ahead of time like I meal prep for the week of my period because I don't know how the pain scale is going to look so I prep everything and like make sure that I've got like fresh bed sheets and blankets and cozy things I just love coziness so I invite all of that in and like it's almost like a version of nesting and I love it it's great yeah but it's not like you're saying that like you know you have that and then if anything because obviously you have to deal with a lot more extremes at endometriosis um yeah. Like if you have that ready to go when it happens, you're like, oh, I feel so good now. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that is the thing. Like taking care of yourself like that is such an empowering thing to do, I think, you know. Yeah. How do you find um having like li living with endometriosis? Is it yeah. like how do you find managing it? Yeah, it's um it's been a journey, um, for sure. I didn't get diagnosed until I was till 2022. So I was 29. Yeah. I didn't get diagnosed till I was 29. And um it's a funny one, I think, because late diagnoses come in for women in so many different areas. I just have always had extreme pain every single month. And, you know, I was always fainting at school and fainting in college. And, you know, at work, I would have such issues with um, pain management and trying to get through the day at work. Um, and eventually I was like, this is, this can't be normal. Like this just can't be normal. And I think it's so interesting that concept of gaslighting women into thinking that this is a normal occurrence and this is a normal thing when it's absolutely not is, is so wild to me. And I was actually speaking to, I went into a pharmacy a couple of months ago and I was like, I'm looking for the strongest thing you have what is it and the lady was so kind and she said Nurofen plus and I said is that all <laughs> and she said and she said yeah that's kind of it I think this is probably what we have in stock anyway this is what I would recommend and I was like isn't it so interesting that they're building armies of AI robots and we still have not got mm -hmm. this issue sorted yeah like uh the priorities are so skewed it's just so heartbreaking you know yeah I do you know what the reason I actually asked about the endometriosis was because of the fact I know especially in Ireland it's starting to 
be known a little bit better but it's mm. so like it's so unknown and so many like you said women being gaslighted into think like oh it's just normal to be crippled every month yeah. it's uh, so I wanted to kind of highlight and even try and like bring that before and like even bring in your experience and like you said the neurofen plus like that's it's yeah. wild that's all you can get <laughs> yeah yeah it's just it's just crazy to me and then you know the methods that they that we're using at the moment to try and tackle it you know we're putting things in like the marina coil things like that but even I know that um pain management in IUD insertion has been a, a big topic of conversation over the last year or so and I'm so happy that that's come into play because you know I was told to take a Ponstan before my appointment you know, I, that was a method that I gave a go to for a little while. And when I went into my appointment, yeah, they were like, did you take your pond stand? What do you mean? Did I take my pond stand? Please put an IV line in, drug me up and then send me home again. <laughs> like, why are we not? Yeah. Like, and you know, I, we do, we do that for other, even diagnostic testing, you know, for colonoscopies, things like that. You'll get, usually you'll get like an IV um, line put in and some sedatives and that helps but nothing, nothing at all is, is given to women for IUD insertion, which is just wild to me. It's a, it's wild. Yeah. That is crazy. It's like, why, why has it just been like put up with, I suppose, in a sense? Um, yeah. But like, I think it's good now there are more people out highlighting the fact that it's not something you just like do. Like, you know, it's the same, like the Marina Coil is probably helping because it's stopping the Mm. they're like ablation stuff like that but it's not fixing the issue either mm -mm, um, no and the no. same issue with PCOS they always put people on the pill because like that will fix your periods but it, it doesn't it masks it for another yes. 10 years yeah for sure and I thought recently I was reading something and I thought it was more common knowledge but it turns out that it's not you know the is it the combination pill there's a the progesterone only pill and mm. then there's a pill that does contain estrogen and you stop it for I believe five days or so in order to get yeah. a period but mm -hmm. that's not a period um and not many women know this mm -hmm. so yeah, I just find that interesting too that like practitioners are so openly calling that a period but it's it's not a period because you haven't ovulated so you know yeah <laughs> really it's wild, isn't it like yeah I did learn that but I, again same thing I only learned it like maybe two three years ago like I'm 33 yeah. I've only learned most of my stuff about menstrual health in the last like since COVID I'm like yeah, yeah me too yeah it's something you don't talk about you put that away and now like I love that so many women are like going this and this and this and like not being afraid to talk about it even if people go e -e -e. yeah and I just think that there's such a huge link to mental well-being you know so mm -hmm. I like so openly with my clients talk about it all the time if someone comes in and like plugs down in the chair in front of me and goes oh my god go gentle today because I'm due my period I'm like this is great to know like this is great for for me to know you know what I mean mm -hmm. it, it sort of sets the scene for the session and we can decide you know how much or how little this person um wants to get into things on that day based on how they're feeling like I, I really do think it's got a direct link to mental health and we just don't link it enough and we don't talk about it enough you know I like the, there's well I don't know, studies but there's a lot of um signs between being on the pill and mental mental health issues and people having to come off the pill because it's actually destroying them mentally like yes yeah I funnily enough I actually experienced that myself when I was living in Australia I was on the pill at the time I believe and then I brought over I got like six months supply but sure I was gone for a year and when that was coming up to running out I went to a doctor there and they didn't have the type that I was on and he said maybe the keyword there is he but I don't know I don't know <laughs> conversation for another day it's an interesting one isn't it but he put me onto another pill and he was like I think this is similar go on this one and I was so so anxious I remember being at work I was working in a call center one time for a health insurance company it was the best crack in the whole world and they had some tvs on while we were working no idea why because the sound was never on because we were all on calls it was so strange but I remember Lord of the Rings was playing to my left hand side and I'm scared of absolutely everything which is so funny because I'm a therapist but I'm so scared <laughs> of everything but like jump scares are not for me Halloween no 
no thank you like the second the first of november comes and mariah carey goes it's time i'm right there but <laughs> halloween is a no <laughs> so, halloween one i i can't stand christmas <laughs> <laughs> so like so this thing was playing and i remember getting so anxious because i was afraid of what was on the television but it was like times 10 whereas on a normal day i would have gone oh that's lord of the rings that's really funny that it's playing in the office i'll probably get a few jump scares that's gas and i would have had the crack with it but i was actually starting to panic and i remember being like oh my goodness that's not really like me and then the panic got worse and worse and worse and i ended up having to come off that that pill altogether and just come off all all of that medication altogether um yeah it's it's wild how it can mess with your head it really is it's horrible it's mad yeah because i was on it for years and i don't know if it ever affected me the reason being because i wasn't in tune with how i felt so i can't mm -hmm. say if it was a fake case of it was or mm -hmm. i was ignoring everything anyway so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually yeah. an interesting kind of not sure yeah yeah um yeah. But like I say, I feel like I it didn't. But again, as like I never comment until really recently, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll go back on it now for a while and see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, it's for science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. An experiment, an experiment. Yeah. Um. So coming back to the kind of the therapy stuff and everything, you work with veterinary vet, vets, veterinary nurses. Um, yeah. What drew you to working with them over any other niche kind of? Yeah. So, yeah. So to be fully transparent, when I was in veterinary college, when I was studying veterinary nursing, I had to do a lot of placement and rotations and things like that. And I identified a whole host of mental health issues within the profession um, pretty much from the off and I would have been 19, 20, 21 then so very long but very much able to see that there were issues um, and so it was something that I was really curious about at the time but at the time also it was too big of a beast to sort of try and navigate and so then when I was doing my psychology BA I had to do a thesis and I was like, wait a minute, mental health in the veterinary field. Let me see if I can actually, you know, revisit this and do a bit of research around this because I discovered that there was no research done um, in Ireland. There was, I think, maybe like one or two papers released by people, written by people, but there was no research done at all. Um, so I, I just took that on myself and I looked at, I decided to look at compassion, fatigue, stress and participation in self-care and sort of what that might have looked like at the time in the industry. And I found that my sample, given it was small, I believe there was 182 participants, but it was still so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they were already suffering from sort of mild to moderate stress levels and burnout levels already um their interaction with self-care was really poor so only four percent of them participated in like proactively participated in self-care um and only three percent of them were willing to explore new ways of caring for themselves and actually be proactive and interact with the concept of self-care itself and ex an exploration of that so yeah it was something that i noticed when i was studying at the time couldn't hold space for it it was really difficult the things that i was seeing were very difficult um and so i i parked it but yeah when i came back to my to my psychology ba in particular i, I was like right let me let me go ahead and, and revisit this and see if i can make some changes and, and help you know yeah do, do you think people don't take the mental toll on vets as seriously as say human doctors 100 percent, yeah 100 percent. um i think there's a couple of factors involved in that from what i'm seeing but we need more research on it so this is definitely coming from me and my personal and professional opinion as a practitioner and um, not necessarily research the first thing i'll say to you is that there's an absolutely huge disconnect between the general public and veterinary staff the general public just don't seem to have a good enough idea of what's actually involved in veterinary care what's actually involved in veterinary as a career and um, what vets and vet nurses and um 
animal care assistants and receptionists deal with on a day-to-day -day basis the general public is completely ignorant to I believe at the moment and um, there's also a real disconnect there in terms of you know how much people should pay for veterinary care there's yeah there's just this huge huge disconnect between the general public and vet staff and that is so so unhelpful because then that causes tension and um, clients come in and they're really really angry or unreasonable and um, their behavior client behavior is constantly just rewarded over and over again particularly by management teams who don't seem to want to address the knowledge gap and address the connection gap so it's just this real vicious cycle with clients um and then within the industry itself i think that mental health issues people very naturally so because our brain's very smart will avoid 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 as much as possible and i can have so much compassion and empathy for that because again our brains are smart if we see something that we don't like that we're worried about we'll instantly want to avoid it that's the easiest way for us to sort of process and get out of it um but I do think that a lot is still being brushed under the rug. And the reality of it is, is that vets are four times more likely to end their life in comparison to the general population and two times more likely in comparison to other healthcare practitioners. And that is vets alone. We don't have any stats um, around veterinary nurses, particularly in Ireland. We don't know what that stat looks like for them and um, we do know though thanks to the vci that veterinary nurses are more susceptible to psychological distress which is so interesting so mm -hmm. there is sort of um little bits trickling trickling out of the woodwork now little bits of research but yeah i just think it's it's still it's i think we're still where we're at when i started my instagram page and like sort of started to build my athena community I started that four years ago and I I don't know that anything has changed since I, okay. I don't has yeah yeah and when it comes to veterinary nurses would their role be similar to like a nurse in like in a hospital or whatever um and yes. I think I suppose it's been very well highlighted how much nurses actually do yeah and I think that probably needs to be highlighted for the vet nurses as well because I wouldn't be surprised if people just assume they're the ones that take the dog to the cage or something like that, you know? Absolutely, 100%. So veterinary nurses are like human nurses, but they do 10 times more. Like in human nursing, you have departments. So you've got, you know, midwives, you have nurses who will assist with diagnostic imaging, you have all of these different departments, but veterinary nurses are all of the departments in one. You know, like a veterinary nurse could jump from, um, a c-section in a dog right so she's the midwife in that moment um and then in, you know jump to diagnostic imaging so he or she or they are x-raying um helping with dentistry there's like there's all of these different areas and veterinary nurses cover all of them so it's yeah it's, as well it's not like yeah they're all they could be dogs to cats to guinea pigs to depend on where they are like yeah absolutely and they do so so much i was informed of um a statistic yesterday that apparently one of the top reasons that veterinary nurses leave their role in ireland is due to lack of respect from the other um professionals so vets ACAs, receptionists you know the other professionals mm -hmm. within practice um which is just so so sad to me I've also noticed in my time particularly as a psychotherapist that there's an awful lot of unfortunately um abnormal behavior occurring in veterinary practices within the working culture like verbal abuse is really huge um mm -hmm. among colleagues and things like that so that at the moment is being accepted and for in my personal opinion when we accept things like that we, we we're rewarding it you know mm -hmm. so as long as we continue to accept that that behavior is rewarded and those people that are executing that behavior will continue to think that that is okay and that is the norm um whereas actually you know bullying and harassment and handling situations with your colleagues in that way is inappropriate mm -hmm. and we, we do need to to cut back on that because that's such a huge that's such a huge issue um that links directly to mental health as well and it's been shown but just we don't seem to be doing anything with that you know um so yeah 
I'm trying, but I'm only one person. <laughs> so we yeah, have to. But it's, it's one person that needs to be there as well. I think it's really important. Yeah. Like, you know, if someone else sees you doing that, they might be thinking your way. That leads to other people coming into this space and, and really making a difference because like it is like veterinary medicine, veterinary nurses, everything like that. It's so important. And like on top of it, like they have to diagnose things that can't talk to you, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> Yeah. and possibly get bitten or kicked or you know whatever along the way um yeah. so it's just I, I just kind of like I don't know for me like I, I have um a horse and I have two guinea pigs and anytime I go to the vet I'm like like I had to bring one of them in recently and I'm just like I will be yeah do what you need like I know it's going to cost me money but like you guys know tell, like because they were like what do you want to do and I was like what do you what do you suggest yeah. And look, if it's a more expensive option, you know more than me, so I will go with that option. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, it's just, it's wild to me that people are being aggressive or talking down to them and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah. why? Yeah, I know. I know. It, it's really, really interesting because there's also this, like, in recent years, this sort of rhetoric that our animals are our children. Mm. So if your animal is your child, and it's just interesting to me that those two things can exist together you know that like verbal abuse about the expense or um a real lack of knowledge around what's happening in the industry if this is your apparent child you know um there's obviously of course a lot a lot of nuance in the in that particular i guess topic you know with owners and their animals there's a lot happening at the moment we're looking at like the you know the bully ban that's happening at the minute and you know how people are interacting with that and you know there's an awful lot happening i think out there at the moment but there's such a huge disconnect that i think we really do need to now take the reins on you know and i just find it so funny too how um I believe that our government is really lacking knowledge in the veterinary industry too and you know how they respond to or more, more so don't respond to the issues that are happening in the veterinary industry at the moment is is quite telling so you know I'm I'm sort of looking at ways to empower us at this point I think and I do think that we need to involve a more national voice mm. um, in order to help with that what that looks like I don't know yet but I think without going down the like you know political rabbit hole, we yeah. all know how many issues are in the HSE at the moment. If they can't even deal with the humans, they're yeah. not going to look after animals or vets. And yeah. that's not to say that that's not an excuse. It's just yeah. an unfortunate fact. Yeah. yeah, just the reality of what we're dealing with, the space that we're in at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I suppose I guess my little bit is just being able to offer specialized yeah. care I guess for veterinary staff and hope that that makes even a little bit of a difference you know to the it is, like you know even if it's a small group of people it, it is making a difference to them mm. that it wouldn't have before and you could you don't know who you're saving right now as well like you know yeah, that's true yeah that's true I didn't think of that <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true yeah. I'm always like, yeah. like any any little bit I think is really really important and it needs to be acknowledged um have you any tips for any kind of vet staff who may be struggling at the moment um, to maybe get them even started down a little road towards self-care? Because maybe they're not ready for therapy. I know everyone takes, especially in here, it takes a long time for people to accept it, I think, and go for it. Like, Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. And you're so right, Chrissy, because you mentioned clients that I've had in the past who've said, oh, it's taken me a while to contact you. So, yeah, it makes perfect I'm sense. I'm saying that's a perfect experience as well. It took me so long. Yeah. <laughs> It takes a while though it does yeah. it does so the first thing that I would say to people if you're listening and you're thinking to yourself I'm not in a good place right now and I do need a bit of help the first thing that I would say to them is ask yourself what you need or what you think you might need there are going to be people listening to this who will hear that and go but I don't know so in that case I'm going to say to you get out a journal and a pen get out a piece of paper and a pen and list things that you need and um, and don't hold back on that so even if you consider those things to be unreasonable or unrealistic don't censor yourself just write a big long list about what it is that you need either in this moment you know 
in your current life situation um, and that will just kind of give you a better idea then of where you might need to start right so like if somebody writes down that they need rest that might mean okay how can we go about getting you that rest is it that you book a doctor's appointment for tomorrow you get a cert you get signed off for a week you go on a week's rest and um, does that look like for some people that's actually going to look like a career break as well so it just completely depends on you know what what their life is looking like at the time if somebody is leaning more towards feelings i want to feel happier i want to feel calmer straight away i'm wondering right but what makes you happy though right or what makes you calm like what are those things that make you feel that way and then how do you get those so if you're really just at a loss what do you need is a really, really key question, I think. Um, and it is, it can be overwhelming. So that's exactly why I say, get out the paper and the pen, write a list and don't censor yourself. Just whatever it is that you need, write it down. And then from that list, how do you get those things? You know? What if you've got someone who's going to who's gonna hear this and go, oh, I don't have time for that. Oh, that's like. Yeah, yeah, fair. I'm going to give tough love in that case. And I'm yeah. going to say, make the time. Yeah. yeah absolutely make the time and you know even if it's a case not ideal but even if it's a case when you get into bed at night and it's midnight and you have the paper and the pen ready that'll do um but more so ideally you would make time during the day you would take five minutes what how many how much time does this take like five minutes if you set the time and even set a timer on your phone if you have to be strict about it two minutes on your phone go write your list write as many things as on, on the page as you can you know um yeah because time while I have so much compassion for that I have no time taking your time back as your own is going to be so key I think if you're at a low point and you know if there is somebody listening to this going I've never been lower I'm at my lowest you have nothing to lose if you if you are feeling like you are at rock bottom the only way from rock bottom is upwards so make the time you know take the pause um and check your people pleasing too on the way yeah yeah <laughs> make, it is it is yeah but make make the time yeah yeah so important mm -hmm. yeah no i i asked you that on purpose and i was hoping you'd say something like that because it is like it's it's difficult to like do something for yourself isn't it yeah can be yeah yeah it can be um and you know what? It's lovely because I'm in a place at the moment where it's it's easy to do things for myself and mm -hmm. I'm OK with that. So just I wanted to say that and just disclose that little bit because I want people to know that you can get there and it, it won't always be difficult to do things for yourself, you know, and there will come a time and there can come a time when you will enjoy it. And that's lovely, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's just so, so important. Um, mm. And it is hard to make that time. And like, like I've been in that position as well. Like you're like, oh, no, I don't have time to look after myself, but like you need to. Yeah, 100%. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. And I think there's also a misconception that self-care is a thing that we do when things are bad. It's actually a thing that we're supposed to do when things are good. It's a preventative measure. It's not a solution. You know, so if you're coming at it from a solution point of view, because you've got no other choice, then that's fine. Dive in. But if you can come at it from a preventative measure um, angle instead, I fully recommend that instead, you know, because there's nothing worse than trying to figure out what works when you're burnt out. Whereas if you figure out what works when things are going kind of OK for you, you'll know what to do already when you're burnt out. You know, so yeah. there's less decision making fatigue and things, things in there, too. Yeah, no, that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. um is there anything as well like that you think veterinary staff should know right now if you mm -hmm. could like have a you could go a microphone to all of them now is there what was something that you could um you'd love to tell them all yeah yeah for sure um the first thing that i would say is that your feelings are valid and just because somebody around you is telling you that there's maybe no mental health crisis in the industry or there's no issues in the practice that you're in at the moment um and they're really really heavy on the side of denial um on their plate mm -hmm. 
your worries and your concerns are still extremely valid. The research is there to prove otherwise. So what you're feeling is not a lie and is not a mistruth. It's it's all completely valid. The second thing that I would say, and I don't know whether I would say it or question it instead maybe, is how can we now take responsibility for what's going on in the industry and help people to know about it. I think that we do an awful lot of um, complaining and discussing amongst ourselves about negative client experiences and you know what we think of the general public. I see client shaming memes and everything all the time. And while they're absolutely hilarious and I get a laugh out of them myself, nothing is moving forward unless we take some sort of responsibility for how we're feeling and ourselves and move us forward. Um, you know, if nobody is listening, we really need to, at this point, make them listen. So I would ask them all, how do we do that? Um, who do we contact? Which microphone do we pick up first? Because at, as it stands at the moment, nothing is improving. So how do we improve? you know, and how do we let people know what's happening? There was a beautiful national campaign in Australia recently um, by a charity called Sophie's Legacy. Sophie died by suicide in 2021 and her family have launched a campaign called Sophie's Legacy. And they recently did, um, I believe it's called the Lost Campaign. Um, really, really heartbreaking, but very effective. They put Sophie's picture on a Lost poster. You know, when someone has lost a pet, yes. So they put Sophie's picture on the last post and took that poster sort of within a national campaign to raise awareness um, of suicide in the veterinary industry. And Sophie in particular, I believe, dealt with a really difficult client interaction um, very close to the time that she ended her life. And her family on that quite a bit in her experience of that. Um, so the the campaign very much does lean into trying to educate the general public as well about what vets like Sophie and other veterinary professionals go through. So, you know, we have done absolutely nothing like that in this country at all. And we're doing a lot of talk and we're doing a lot of chatter. What are we doing with the chatter though? You know what I mean? Because yeah. still nobody knows about it. Um, still nothing is changing. And, you know, it's it's actually World Mental Health Day today, <laughs> the day that we're recording in October, yeah. <laughs> So even, you know, on my like fourth um, World Mental Health Day as um, Athena's mind, like still nothing has changed. And yeah, I just want to get that megaphone and say, how do we change it? Like, how are we now going to take responsibility for what's happening and, and actually make a change, you know? Yeah, I, do you know what I love? Um, do I, oh, damn, it's gone. Take your time. That happens all the time. That's really you, you said something really good in there, and I was like, "Oh no!" I was talking about the last campaign. That was unreal. Jesus, that nearly made me cry. Oh, and yeah. humans never make me cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the oh no, that's completely. Yeah, now it's completely gone. But anyway, I'm gonna go to someone else. I love it. I love um the way you you would say as well, like how do we change it? Like yeah. you're putting it out to everyone, giving everyone yeah. a chance to contribute. It's not a case of this needs to be done to be changed. Yeah. Um, and it's just uh really, really important because you know, I think like you said there as well, there is you they're saying there's no mental health issue in the industry. There's a mental health in uh issue in every yeah. industry shape place everywhere right now um so yeah. there's no way the vet industry can be immune to it yeah uh, so like anyone saying there's no issue is definitely in denial I think yes 100 percent. and I have so much compassion and empathy for the denial too because again our brains are smart we're going to avoid things that we don't like the look and sound of mm -hmm. but at the end of the day we have a crisis in our industry and I can't fix it by myself, <laughs> do you know? So as much given out as we do about the different things and the different things that are wrong, I I just don't see anybody doing anything about it. Um, 
as a collective and I do think that to be honest with you it falls a lot also on management teams and I think management teams need to now take a really hard look at themselves and ask themselves what they can now do to move forward and what they can do to stop rewarding bad behavior from clients and also bad behavior from their staff right so like I've seen so many job reviews um, I was looking at Glassdoor this morning actually at various veterinary practices around the country and the, the amount of people that say kind of that you know the bullies in the practice are doing very well where the bullies in the practice are getting promoted I just think that that is so fascinating to me because in any other industry that person would be straight to HR on yeah, like a yeah like on, on a you know performance improvement plan pip yeah. whatever the thing is or, <laughs> well, or like they'd be fired but for some reason you know really practices, i'd say many of them don't even have hr because they're quite small that's the thing too i've seen a lot of management um make really funny hr decisions <laughs> completely rogue um i've seen that as well and it's really interesting so yeah like I do think the management teams really need to take a hard look at themselves and what's actually happening in in their practice and start to listen to their to their staff um a lot of staff are going really unheard um which is bringing a lot of them to me to be honest so you know um while you can deny it all you like your staff are in my dms and in my emails looking for appointments yeah so So, you know something has to change Yeah, yeah 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 absolutely um I think that is pretty much everything I have to ask you today, Aoife, but there is one question I'd like to ask everyone at the end of every podcast, yeah, and that is, yeah. what is the best advice you've ever been given? Oh my God. Oh, I'm yeah. going to give you a good one. I'm going to give you a good one. This one comes from my granddad. His name was Jackie. He was amazing. And he always told me, and I'm going to try not to cry. Oh my God. I'm going to try not to cry <laughs> so I can deliver it well. I gave it to the first year vet nurses in UCD yesterday too. It's nice to know you're nice to know. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's really, really lovely to know that you are a nice, good person to know. And that doesn't come from a place of narcissism, which is why I love it. I think Mm -hmm. and there's no agenda behind it and there's no manipulation behind it. It's just the sentiment that if you are showing up as your authentic self and being kind, that's all that is asked of you and people know that you're kind in return um, and the cycle continues so I just think that's a really special thing that I've always I've always lived by and it's just my favorite thing in the whole world <laughs> oh it's absolutely beautiful and you are definitely living up to that I think oh thank you <laughs> I hope hopefully we're making you proud <laughs> oh no definitely I would be, I wouldn't doubt for a second that you are oh um with that as well where can everybody find you yeah cool so I'm on Instagram I'm at Athena's Mind Therapy I also have a podcast myself called the Vet Glow Podcast so on Instagram I'm at Vet Glow Pod with that one um and if anybody needs to email me just click the email button on my Instagram page or Chrissy I'm sure you might put, put my email in the in the show notes or whatever oh, for everybody yeah, well. put all your details to, so people can yeah. find it there. yeah but Instagram is my main home so it's at Athena's Mind Therapy yeah and I do recommend people following her because the content is just great and it's so like positive and uplifting. Um, uh, if you are looking to find me as well, I am on Instagram and TikTok. So my Instagram is at Strong the Saddle with an underscore because someone got the Instagram first. And then oh. <laughs> so it's, uh, on TikTok, there's no underscore because I got there first. Yeah. Uh, and then my website is www.chrissyhawkins.com. So I just really want to say thanks again for joining us today. Eve. It was a great oh. conversation. Chrissy, thank you for having me. It's It's been so, so lovely chatting to you. Yeah, and I hope that everybody's enjoyed it for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just another button there. I really do appreciate everybody who listens to this podcast. So if you please could help me with the algorithm and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And even, you know, if you want to reach out and suggest topics for me i'd be delighted to hear from you drop me a dm on instagram or tiktok and thanks again for listening